Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our sixth talk in this term's public seminar series at the Refugee Study Center at Oxford University. Uh, my name is Hannah Brandkamp, and I'm a department lecturer in forced migration here at the RSC in Oxford. Um, the theme for this series, as many of you will know, is race, borders, and global immobility. And the aim of the, the of the series is to better understand the violence that life seekers, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, and people on the move more broadly routinely experience at the hands of states and other actors across the world. And notoriously, this includes detention, deportation, policing, encampment, imprisonment, interceptions at sea, pushbacks, surveillance, abandonment, and racist immigration policies, um, which impact in particular people racialized as black, brown, and indigenous, and in particular those from the majority world or the global south. And speakers in this series have grappled with a wide range of questions, um, as many of you will know who've attended um, our past sessions, um, including um, race and racism, coloniality, nationalism, citizenship, belonging, criminalization, security, and bordering. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Hassan Old Mokhtar as our speaker for today, who will speak on the constitutive exterior, EU border externalization, and the, and the social dynamics of the Senegal River Valley. Um, Hassan is an ESRC postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Development Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Um, his PhD examined how EU border externalization intervenes within social relations and structures in Mauritania. His research interests more broadly concern migration, borders and development with a focus on Mauritania and the West African Sahel. Um, he is a member of the coordination team for the West Africa Working Group of the MigrationControl.info Research Network, a group that is devoted to the critical documentation and analysis of EU externalization policies. Um, Hassan's work has been published in the journal uh, Anthropologie et Développement, uh, in Movements, Journal for Critical Migration and Border Studies, and the SOAS Develop, um, Development Studies blog, and there's much more in the pipeline, as uh, Hassan has assured me. What I'm going to say now is in my personal capacity. Um, I just want to acknowledge before we start the incredible fight that colleagues and comrades in the universities and college union UCU are putting up to fight for a fair pension, fair pay and a better university for all of us and all colleagues. Um, work tirelessly to give students the best education and do fantastic research that we can bring to you through these public seminar series and make the university what it is. Um, but university managers up and down the country have shown nothing but contempt for our working conditions, um, as uh, is evidenced by yesterday's decision to cut uh, staff pensions further. And we all do this because we love our work and I'm, and I'm hoping for better days ahead. Now that we're moving to our talk, I would encourage you to uh, submit your questions that you have for Hassan in the Q&A box um, at the bottom in Zoom, and I will then direct those questions uh, to uh, uh, Hassan at the very end of the talk. Okay, over to you, Hassan. I'm looking forward to this talk. Thank you very much, Hanno, for uh, the kind words, the introduction, and also the, also the statement. Um, of uh, solidarity with colleagues and uh, comrades in uh, the UCU, which I um, absolutely echo. Um, and thanks for the invitation um, and for putting this seminar series together. It's uh, really exciting to be a part of, um, and I hope for ways that these con conversations can be continued and acted upon. Um, uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, I'd also like to say thanks to Amy um, for making sure that all of the technical uh, technical aspects are um, seen to and uh, running smoothly. Okay, so um, as Hanno mentioned, the doctoral research upon which this talk is based is uh, broadly concerned with how um, EU border externalization policies intervene within social relations structures and uh, their historical legacies in Mauritania. Um, and what I'd like to try and do today is examine that broad uh, area of inquiry with reference to one particular context in Mauritania, um, namely that which is, um, namely the, there we go, okay. Um, 
namely how it unfolds in the um, small Senegal River Valley town of Rosso, which is a small town uh, that just straddles the border between Mauritania and Senegal. Um, so I think I might start this inquiry or this talk by um, observing that in the Mauritanian dialect of Arabic, which is uh, called Hassaniya, um, the Senegal River town, town, Valley town of Rosso is referred to as uh, Le Guerib. So this is the plural of the word Gerib, or in Arabic Qarib, uh, which means a small fishing canoe, or what in French is called a pirogue. So this name, I would suggest, highlights the importance of the Senegal River and its daily crossings, both to the material workings of the town, as well as to how it is popularly imagined. Now, on the other hand, um, within the discourse and aesthetics of the so-called EU migration crisis, uh, particularly as it's played out on the West Mediterranean, the pirogue, the small fishing canoe, um, is something of a, of, of a watchword. Media depictions and discussions of the, quote, pirogue phenomenon or the, quote, pirogue crisis, these evoke images of desperate people being intercepted at sea or washing up on sun-soaked Spanish shores. Now, such images and depictions serve as justification and even impetus for the process of uh, border externalization, which for those who don't know, uh, simply refers to the, the shifting of responsibility for preventing unwanted Europe and migration to actors at and increasingly beyond the EU borderline. Now, I think it goes without saying that this process of externalization is necessarily a Eurocentric one, given that it reduces all of the, the lands uh, beyond the EU border in all of their complexity and contradiction, uh, it reduces them to their sole capacity as source points of irregular Europe and migration. <clears throat> so within this Eurocentric imaginary, uh, the Senegal River Valley town of Rosso, the Guedib, is typically one of two, two things. It's either a node that's to be crossed on an invariably Europe and uh, north of a journey, or it's a point through which deportations that are aimed at diminishing the quantity of such journeys can be executed. I would like to suggest that a pretty, pretty different conception lies in the Hassaniya term, the Guerib, since it recognizes the centrality of the crossings that connect social life um, on the opposite banks of the Senegal River. So it's this juxtaposition um, that I'd like to try and explore over the course of the next uh, 30 minutes or so. This juxtaposition between the Eurocentric depictions of places like Rosso on uh, the one hand and the situated social dynamics of such places on the other. And in doing so, we'll see how the externalization process doesn't unfold in a vacuum, but is rather uh, shaped and conditioned in, uh, in, in, very, in a very fundamental sense by these social dynamics and associated historical legacies. So in making this case, I'm uh, of course drawing from a pretty broad and burgeoning literature on EU uh, border externalization. And in particular, that which has shown that the EU border regime tends to produce the very migrant illegality that it claims to prevent. This process of uh, producing migrant illegality, um, or what Nicholas de Geneva calls deportability, this can take on a, a cartographic form, um, whereby these vast and complex regions beyond the EU border are mapped and analysed exclusively in terms of their capacity as source points of European migration. And uh, I think Sebastian Covarrubias has shown this pretty, um, pretty effectively. But this process of reducing illegality also takes on an embodied form, in that the illegality, the policy category of uh, irregular migration or illegality, becomes injected as a category of experience into the social dynamics and relations that make up these regions beyond the EU border um, in practice, um, as Ruben Anderson has very um, meticulously documented. So to kind of conceptually frame how this process of producing illegality relates to these regional dynamics and relations, I'm loosely taking heed from um, Marxian discussions, uh, particularly I think those associated with Rosa Luxemburg around um, the idea of capitalism's constitutive outside. The idea simply being that as capitalism spreads around the globe, the form that it takes is conditioned by the particular dynamics and uh, struggles of the locales in which it manifests. This uh, leads uh, Sandra Mazatra to highlight, quote, the street strategic role of encounters in the fabric uh, of modernity. So this is kind of loosely where I'm coming from in conceptual terms, but 
within this talk, I'd like to spend the rest uh, of the time uh, more examining the empirical details of this particular encounter, namely between the EU border regime and its externalization strategies and the social dynamics of the Senegal River Valley. Now, to do this, I'll be drawing from 11 months of field work uh, carried out in Mauritania over the course of 2017 and 18, during which two separate um, field visits to Rosso were uh, carried out. So for the rest of the talk, what I'd like to do is, um, I guess, divide it into two broad sections. The first will look at the infrastructure of externalization that's been recently installed at the Rosso border crossing. Um, and I'll draw attention to the social dynamics that underpin it and that mediate it and condition it. Um, and then the second part, I'll look into the experiences of uh, migrants who have been illegalized by the EU border regime. Um, and I'll examine a bit how their experience in Rosso um, relates to uh, these social dynamics and, and uh, relations, and in particular, a regional history of displacement and accumulation by dispossession. Okay, so maybe to start out with the Rosso border crossing and the infrastructure of externalization here. So um, just a descriptive comment to start. So for anyone crossing the national territorial border between Senegal and Mauritania at Rosso, they'll do so either by ferry or by a uh, kudok, by a small fishing canoe. This ferry crosses several times a day, but at pretty indeterminate intervals. Um, but for travelers who are willing to brave the, the fishing canoes and their, um, their drivers negotiating tactics, um, getting across the river can be done pretty quickly. Now for the less foolhardy, the, uh, the ferry also takes individual passengers on board. In front of the ferry dock is a larger building where entry exit stamps are obtained and visas issued. And at the east end is the formal entry point into Mauritanian state territory for individual travelers. This is a single police building uh, divided into four separate rooms, two by which people entering Mauritanian state territory are processed and two for those exiting state territory. Um, I'd like to really stress that this space is a crucial node within the architecture of the EU border regime in West Africa. It's the end point of one of two principal deportation routes from Mauritania, um, the other leading uh, from Nouakchott to a village called uh, Gogi on the, the, the border with Mali. Um, so anyone who is detained um, and is to be deported in Mauritanian uh, state territory will be deported either through here or um, through the Gogi border. Now, in more concrete terms, the Rosso border crossing was integrated into the EU border regime in West Africa by means of a border infrastructure uh, project, which was envis envisioned within Mauritania's 2010 National Migration Strategy. So this strategy, this National Migration Strategy, was itself uh, the fruit of developments on the Atlantic route to the Canary Islands in 2006, when an increase in people leaving the coast of West Africa um, prompted a series of militarized measures on the part of Spain and the EU, which you can see depicted on uh, in the image on the left. Now, the more long-term policy response to these arrivals was a new national migration strategy that was drawn up by um, EU technical experts in 2010. Now, within its four so-called strategic axes, it envis envisioned an ambitious range of projects, one of which involved upgrading the uh, border infrastructure of the state. The Rosso border crossing is, as a result, one of 45 uh, territorial entry points that have been endowed with material and technological infrastructure as a result of this process. <coughs> Excuse me. So back to the border itself, a customs official who showed me around it um, said, uh, as he was uh, showing me around, the European Union did all of that, gesturing towards the uh, police and immigration buildings that were constructed as a result of the infrastructure project. Now, as um, Philippe Froud observes, this EU-funded border post at Rosso, quote, shows pre precisely how material infrastructure is actually instilling new global, new routines through the global border management norms that they convey. 
this is observable in, for example, a clear um, spatial separation between entrance and exit as the new police building at Rosso um, leading out of the border ensures. The border is for, further aligned with international migration and border management standards through the technological infrastructure that's uh, been put in place here, also as a result of um, the externalization process. <coughs> the Rosso border crossing is one of two territorial entry exit points at which the IOM's personal identification and regist uh, registry system has been piloted. So this uh, uh, enables the, connect the, the data that's, uh, connected, that's collected at the Rosso border crossing, so entry exit data and so forth, to be integrated within uh, regional and global security and policing databases, such as those of uh, Interpol. So of course, it should be stated now that uh, this technological and material infrastructure, it aspires to manage and to map um, uh, entry exit data, ID data, um, mobility, uh, etc. But it doesn't always succeed in its aspiration. Um, I'd like to draw attention to two aspects of the social dynamics in Rosso that uh, hinder this aspiration. <clears throat> First of these is a um, pretty extractive informal economy that's in operation at the Rosso border. So beneath the physical cues of the Rosso border, there lies a pretty different logic of access. And this is one governed more by informal social networks and relations. So for the EU, for the IOM, <clears throat> the national security forces that are stationed at Rosso, they are there to ensure the regional stability by managing the international flow of goods and people in an efficient and responsible manner. But for many police and customs officials on the ground, the formal procedures that are impelled and uh, encouraged by mi migration management discourse, these become sites of informal revenue generation. In an observation report on the Rosso border crossing that was put together by a, um, a coalition of national and uh, regional human rights organizations, uh, this informal economy is uh, discussed and um, its relationship to uh, to the border crossing uh, detailed. In the words of the report, <clears throat> administrative harassment is common currency, nourished by the security and defense forces, working with individuals who act as intermediaries for travelers. These intermediaries take responsibility for administrative procedures alongside uh, the security and defense force for, for financial transactions carried out in total capacity, end quote. Now, crucially, the material infrastructure that was uh, constructed by the EU contributes to this, uh, to this enterprise um, by, for example, the narrow uh, pathway uh, leading up to the new police building and the long lines that it creates, which create a demand for procedures to be ex expedited and therefore a, uh, a demand that is uh, responded to by um, intermediaries. So, <clears throat> this informal network of extortion and bribery means that while the Rosso border is a key technology of externalization, it's also a pretty inefficient one. Um, testimonials of uh, people who've been detained and deported in Mauritania that were gathered, gathered by the, um, the research group uh, Migrorup um, affirm this porosity of the Rosso border. In the words of one of their interviewees, quote, even the police, they tell you, accept that you'll get deported and then just come back. The people who deport you, they see you two days later and say nothing. A Guinean migrant worker whom I met in uh, Nouakchott said much the same of his um, experience of deportation to Rosso. <clears throat> Quote, um, if you have money, you don't have a problem. The police down there are looking for money. They're men of the law, but they do business as well. End quote. So while Rosso is the terminus of a national deportation route, being deported here is often far from the definitive endpoint that it's intended to be by the logic of the border regime. So this extractive informal economy at the Rosso border acts upon and uh, shapes the externalization process uh, as it unfolds in practice. So there's one other um, more general aspect of social life in uh, Rosso that I'd like to draw attention to, which is equally constitutive of the form that the externalization process takes here. 
So this is the simple fact that the vast majority of border crossings um, are by residents of the town who live on the Senegalese side, but who work on the Mauritanian side. In the words of the same uh, customs official, they come here every day selling things and then they go back. Now, for these um, residents of Rosso who are making the daily crossing, they're exempt from the, uh, the requirements that are imposed upon international travelers. So even if you are Senegalese or Mauritanian, there are no um, visa requirements or, um, or other such um, requirements. Instead, a laissez-passer card is acquired. So unlike the flashy biometrics of the um, IOM personal identification and registration system, the laissez-passer is an entirely analog technology. It's a, a small card that can be attained, obtained at the office of the municipality uh, on either side of the town for a fee of, I think, 500 uh, cephas, which is the uh, release currency, and it's valid for a month. So upon, upon exiting national territory, the cardholder leaves their ID uh, at the police building, presents the essay passe on the other side, and then recuperates their ID when they return. <clears throat> so this laissez passe serves to preserve the town of Rosso as a, a kind of a contiguous sphere of mobility and circulation, notwithstanding the international border that cuts through it and which is uh, upheld by the infrastructure of externalization. So much like the extractive informal economy at the border, um, the circular patterns of mobility that define uh, Rosso or Le Guerib, um, these force compromises on the technological and the material infrastructure of externalization here. <coughs> Excuse me, um, residual COVID symptoms. Um, so this is in broad terms how the social dynamics uh, and uh, relations of uh, the town of Rosso act upon and uh, force compromises on the infrastructure of externalization at the Rosso border. So in the time that I have remaining, I'll briefly turn to the other pole of the uh, migrant border dialectic, namely the illegalized migrant. Um, and we'll look at how their experiences are equally conditioned and shaped by social dynamics um, and processes in Rosso. I'll draw attention to um, the experiences of two individuals whom I met in uh, Rosso, Ali Bakar and Soro. Uh, and I should stress these are pseudonyms. Um, so yeah, the, I crossed paths with each of these uh, guys um, at a vegetable stall uh, just outside of the, the Rosso border crossing. Um, Ali Bakar was uh, from the the Mopti region, uh, sorry, the Timbuktu region of uh, Mali. And he told me of um, working in a, a Turkish-owned factory in Liby Libya um, with his brother uh, up until uh, the time of the fall of Gaddafi, at which point um, his brother makes the Mediterranean, to, Mediterranean crossing to Italy. Ali Bakar, on the other hand, uh, flees south and eventually arrives in uh, Mauritania in November 2017. Sorrow uh, narrated a uh, pretty sc scattered and violent trajectory to me. So he spoke of being intercepted at sea off the Algerian coast, being robbed in the Algerian desert, being deported to Niger by um, Algerian security forces, and um, participating in an IOM so called uh, voluntary return from Libya. So we can see that both of these individuals have uh, fallen prey to the physical violence and political violence and what Vicky Squire would call the biophysical violence that um, characterizes the experience of uh, illegality as it is produced by the border regime. Curiously though, many of these violent markers of illegality that characterize their trajectories elsewhere were more conspicuous by their absence in Rosso. So at no point during any of the hours that I spent with either of them here at the border crossing did any interaction, either hostile or otherwise, occur between them and the numerous police that were coming to and from the border. Now, this isn't uh, simply an anecdotal observation on my part. In the words of a human rights activist whom I interviewed in Russell, 
here there aren't raids in the sense of them, here there aren't deportations in the sense of them going around the town, carrying out raids and expelling people. I've never seen that, never, end quote. Now, it should be noted that the association that he works with is very active in campaigning against these raids and de deportations in other parts of the country. But he was emphatic that such raids don't happen in this particular uh, context in Mauritania. A Senegalese community representative um, was even more glowing in his assessment of the, the, the situation in uh, Rosso. In his words, quote, migrants here go unnoticed. The law reigns. Now, as we'll later see, this doesn't mean that other forms of violence uh, are also absent. And in fact, both Ali Bakar and uh, Soro recounted um, experiences of precarious and um, exploited em employment in the, in the rice industry in the town. But I'd like to emphasize for the moment that social dynamics in Rosso are apparently such that um, the illegality that's been shown to be produced by the border regime spades from the surface of lived subjective experience in this particular uh, context. Now, of course, from the perspective, the necessarily Eurocentric perspective of the border regime, these dynamics uh, are irrelevant. Ali Bakr and Soro, from this Eurocentric perspective, are exclusively defined as potential candidates for irregular migration. And Rosso is simply a node through which such candidates move north or by which they are deported south. So there's a clear discrepancy between uh, the Eurocentric gaze of the board regime on the one hand and social dynamics in Rosso. And I'd like to suggest that this, this is an important discrepancy to interrogate because it might um, offer a means of um, analyzing the externalization process in a, in a fashion that uh, doesn't succumb to its own uh, Eurocentric assumptions. So with this in mind, I'll spend the next the final 10 minutes or so, um, answering the question of what fills in for illegality in Rosso. If the border regime finds migrant subjects to illegalize, what sh shapes their experience in the absence of illegality? And what can this tell us about the externalization process? So I'll answer this question with a brief analytical detour whose relevance will hopefully be made uh, apparent presently into um, recent Mauritanian history. So um, over the course of the 1970s and 1980s in Mauritania, there are radical changes in land ownership structures on the Senegal River Valley, which you can see depicted here, um, which is uh, a, a map of um, settlement dynamics on the Senegal River Valley drawn from an OECD report. Now, without going into too much detail, after 1983, you see increasing numbers of agricultural cooperatives being set up by uh, so-called Arab Moors or a group who in Hassaniou would be called Bidan, who are um, very much the, the, the ruling stratum of um, the Mauritanian social structure. So this um, influx of uh, large-scale agricultural cooperatives, cooperatives was uh, facilitated by a 1983 land reform, which in the words of the OECD report, quote, ignores customary law and legalizes expropriations predominantly suffered by Mauritanian Fulani, end quote. The Fulani in Mauritania, much like in many other parts of the, uh, the region are um, in many ways marginalized and uh, at the, the lower rungs of this uh, Mauritanian social structure. Now, these expropriations uh, accelerated dramatically following a wave of uh, racialized violence and expulsions that uh, occurred both within Mauritania and Senegal and between the two countries in uh, 1989 to 1991. Over the course of this uh, racialized violence and expulsions, tens of thousands of Afro-Mauritanian Fulani were deported from the country. <clears throat> um, Senegalese nationals were also uh, primarily among the, those expelled from Mauritania, but I think it's important to note that um, Afro-Mauritanian national citizens also uh, figured among those deported. Now, in 2008, some of those who were deported um, 
were offered the opportunity to return to Mauritania within the framework of a return program that was jointly implemented by the UNHCR, the Senegalese state and the Mauritanian state. <clears throat> Crucially though, they didn't return to their former lands, but rather to resettlement sites that have been set up across the southern regions of Mauritania to accommodate them. Uh, one example of which you can see in the photo on the left, which I took um, during a research trip. So in this light, it's kind of small wonder that uh, for those who've returned, in the words of uh, the head of the Rosso returnee community whom I interviewed, quote, the issue of land ownership remains to be resolved. So while land restitution is a core demand of this returnee community, it's a difficult one to realize because in the aftermath of the expulsions, many of these newly vacated plots of land are taken over by members of the ruling Arab Moor Bidan uh, class, who invest in building a modern agricultural sector here. Um, so we have this modern rice industry that's uh, been built in Rosso and in the region more broadly, largely against the backdrop of this expropriation of uh, Afro-Mauritanian Fulani subsistence farmers. And this is, uh, I think, a pretty textbook case of what David Harvey would call pro uh, accumulation by dispossession. <clears throat> so how does this relate to the illegality that's produced by the border regime? Is there any kind of uh, collective subjectivity that might be said to emerge from these um, distinct structural processes? Well, as I mentioned in passing earlier, both Soro and Ali Bakar worked in different sections of this rice industry. Soro in the rice fields and Ali Bakar in a rice processing factory. Uh, and they were each for different reasons on a temporary hiatus from their work when, uh, when I met them at the uh, vegetable stall near the border. And they're not unique in this regard. The same human rights, rights activists whom I um, quoted earlier uh, who work on migrants' rights issues in the country affirmed that the rice industry was the main employment source for migrant workers in the town. So while the border violence that characterizes Ali Bakar and Soro's previous experience is uh, absent in Rosso, the experience of illegality is absent in Rosso, um, the conditions of violence and exploitation that uh, um, are often facilitated by this illegality remain present in the town. Ali Bakar, for example, uh, had lost his thumb in a machine in a factory. Um, such instances are uh, common. A human rights activist whom I interviewed spoke of the case of a young uh, worker from Guinea-Bissau um, who he had recently supported after he had lost four fingers in a, a machine in a rice processing factory. And he furthermore emphasized that this was one case amongst many. And so these aren't only violent, but also uh, exploitative employment conditions. And um, if you recall the Senegalese community representative who was quite glowing in his assessment of the relations between uh, migrants and the police in the town, um, he was a bit less or more cynical, I guess, uh, about the conditions in the rice industry. Quote, uh, the people in the fields, the seasonal workers, always have problems with the owners of the fields, always, because generally they're not paid by the month, they're paid after the harvest. Sometimes the guy, he keeps the money, he doesn't pay them. So while the returnees remain discarded on the outskirts of Rosso, migrants like Ali Bakar and Soro work under dangerous and precarious conditions within the moder modern agricultural sector that's been erected upon this expropriation. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this slide, I think we might say that Seemingly distinct processes of accumulation by dispossession and border externalization are tied together by what Sandra Mazadra describes as, quote, a deep heterogeneity of subjective positions and experiences within the composition of living labor, end quote. In this case, these experiences include violent pushbacks in the Sahara and interceptions in the Mediterranean, being deported from one's country of origin and sub subsequently dispossessed of land there, and precarious employment in the sector erected on the back of this expropriation. So from the perspective of the board regime, again, people like Ali Bakr and Soro were defined exclusively as potential candidates for regular migration. Rosso was simply a point through which such candidates move north or by, by which they're deported south. But if we shed the Eurocentric vantage point of the border regime, 
and suggest that the social conditions and the migrants it illegalizes are structurally wedded to this regional history of displacement and dispossession on the Senegal River Valley. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just conclude by thinking um, a bit about how all of this, uh, what, what it implies for how we theorize um, and critically analyze the externalization process. So in a contribution to um, a issue of cultural studies um, on uh, critical migration, new keywords in crit critical migration and border studies, um, an entry on externalization states that the definition of the border increasingly refers not to the territorial limit of the state, but to the management practices directed at where the migrant is. So, as we've seen at the Rosso border, these formal management practices become entangled within and conditioned by less formal ones, uh, such as the extractive informal economy that uh, hinders the efficacy of the infrastructure of externalization. These management practices also have to reckon with the fact that the majority of crossings in Rosso are not unidirectional, like uh, south north, but circular. Um, and they also, as a result, have to reckon with the laissez-passer system that's been put in place to facilitate this circular mobility. Um, now, this definition of the border as um, being defined by the management practices directed at where the migrant is, I think, is also useful because it highlights the fact that the border regime views Europe-bound migrants as these isolated objects of management and intervention, and that it's simply a, a case of redirecting resources, whether security resources or development projects, at the where the migrant is perceived to uh, originate, and so that they may stay there. In practice, though, we've seen that um, the experiences of migrants who are elsewhere illegalized by the border regime also encompass, encompass um, this regional history of displacement and dispossession. <clears throat> so I guess for these reasons, I think we would do well to bear in mind that externalization doesn't happen in a vacuum that it necessarily intersects with these regional histories and uh, situated social dynamics. And that interrogating the nature of these intersections um, that might act as a safeguard against the necessarily Eurocentric uh, viewpoint of the board regime manifesting in our um, critical analysis of it. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hassan Old Mokhtar. Thank you so much for, for being with us today and for, for answering all these questions. And thank you to the audience for, um, for all your interesting contributions. And um, have a good evening. Next week, um, we will have uh, Dr. Ali Bagat, who will be talking about uh, global capitalism. Now, I need to look at the actual title. Um, <laughs> Sorry, we'll be talking about governing the displaced in global capitalism, refugee survival from the camp to the city. So if you haven't registered for that yet, um, please do, and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Hassan.